Are you a business owner stuck in fear, doubt, and worry about what the marketplace will look like in the future? Then this show is for you. Strap on your seatbelt and get ready to disrupt and innovate. Here's your host, Lisa Levy. Welcome to a transformative episode of Disrupt and Innovate. Today, I'm honored to host Lindsay Epperly, the CEO of Jet Set World Travel, a company that soared from a one-person operation to a powerhouse team with over 70 dedicated members. Lindsay's journey is nothing short of inspirational. Faced with adversity, she turned challenges into opportunities, navigating her industry's greatest crisis while expecting her first child. What she described is an as an MBA she never wanted has become a pivotal season of growth and resilience for her. In less than three years, Lindsay transformed her circumstances going from losing her home to making the Inc. 5000 fastest growing companies list. She shares her insights on leveraging the illusion of control, turning obstacles into advantages and scaling from solopreneur to a leading, a leading and a leading a thriving organization. With over 15 years experience in the travel industry, she'll articulate the value of charging for your worth, relinquishing control to redefine your identify, and the journey of a female founder in a male-dominated industry. Fabulous topics that I love to cover. Lindsay, welcome to the conversation. Thank you for having me, Lisa. I know it's going to be a good discussion today. I'm so excited. And now I'm off the script, so I don't have to stammer anymore life. It's, it's my reality. So Lindsay, I do obviously an introduction, but what's most interesting to the audience is to hear your story in your words. Will you tell us about your journey and how you got to where you are today and why it's so impactful now? Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you some of the highlights. Thanks for asking. Um, so I entered into the travel industry on a bit of an accident. I was 19 years old. I walked into a local travel agency for a brochure for a family cruise we were going on. And you know, when you're a college student and the answer to everything is yes, you just have that time in your life. So when I got offered a job to sell honeymoons to, you know, other college students, essentially, I said, yeah, that sounds like fun. I'll try that. So I, I accidentally walked out with a job after that, you know, fortuitous day going to grab a brochure. Um, being 19 and being a travel advisor, especially at the time, was a really, really unheard of job description. I mean, right? A lot of people hear the word travel agent and they think that the industry has long since retired the age of the dinosaurs, that the internet put it out of business, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I come, it came into the industry to find out that there was this a resurgence of individuals that were trusting travel advisors, that were looking to them for guidance, and that were looking for the relationships that we as humans could bring to the table. So I saw a lot of opportunity. I really fell in love with the job. I worked as a frontline travel advisor for over 10 years myself. Um, but along the way, I started seeing ways in which we could innovate and meet the kind of, you know, new consumer. For me, it was a lot of millennials, a lot of individuals that were my age, uh, meet them where they were when it came to planning their travel. And so I eventually decided to go out on my own, launch my own business, my own travel agency. And along the way, I just kept solving for problems that I would see, right? So one of those problems to begin with was there seemed to be a lack of transparency and a lack of um, relationship-driven business. And that was kind of the, you know, the instigation of the first version of this agency. Further down the line, it seemed like there was a lack of clear-cut career path options, becoming a travel advisor. And so I, I solved for that by creating a mentorship program. A few years further down the line, I realized really individuals that are travel advisors could use a lot of business know-how and I would love to mentor entrepreneurs. And so I solved for that. So it was like every time we would level up were just opportunities for solutions as uh, as those problems would come about. Um, the biggest problem, of course, and we can totally get into this part of the journey, was that as everyone knows, world pandemic happened, not the best time to be in the travel industry. And um, by that point, my husband had joined me and we were expecting our first daughter. So we had all eggs in one basket, everything hitting at once, had to make some really tough calls. Do we keep the home or do we keep the business? And uh, in keeping the business, we've been able to more than quadruple than how we were going into 2020 and, um, and land on that Inc. 5000 list that you mentioned in the intro. That is a, you know, that's a powerful journey and a nice fast flyover in that you were talking about really looking at the industry that 
And, and so, right, I am more of the dinosaur, right? I am the generation that my parents lived and died with their travel agent. They mm -hmm. were long time lasting relationships. And as a Gen Xer, when the internet came on play, I've never booked through an agent or an advisor because, hey, I have the internet and I can do all of this. But you're growing a business and leveling up, right? You talk through some of the challenges of transparency and the career path and you know business skills for the advisors. You're running a business that, like everyone else, has the opportunity to make connections with your customer and taking them on a journey. And I have, you know, opted out personally of, of the experience of that curated by a human being. But in this day and age, when there are so many options and there's so much misinformation, the human connection coming back around what was once old is new again. And I love that about this approach because I think that you're building a really exceptional customer experience. And that's probably the foundation of what you're doing. So we talk a little bit about that and what you're curating for your customer. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And uh, and I think it's really important to know a lot of people have made that decision, right? They think travel agents no longer exist. I'm just going to do it myself. But then you start actually beginning to do it yourself and realize, wow, it's like drinking from a fire hydrant. There's so much information. I don't know what I don't know. Should I trust random Bobby on TripAdvisor who's never left his hometown but says this resort is great? Like that sounds like a breeding ground for disaster. So I think let's just start with the basics. Even the fact that the word travel agent is a bit of a dated word. The, the whole industry has received a rebrand in calling ourselves travel advisors because we're coming to the table as advisors, as consultants, as someone who looks at holistically what an individual needs for their vacation, right? And that is a combination of what have you done in the past that you've loved and what have you done that you've hated? What is it that your partner wants? What is it that your children want? What is it that you're dreaming of? And how do we bring that to life? Oh, and by the way, what you're dreaming of doesn't exist in that destination you want to go to. So let's regroup and make sure we get you to the right place. Like it's just, it's, it's 90% therapy, honestly, Lisa, <laughs> but it does create a very, very unique opportunity for excellent customer service. And so for us, we are a service-based business and we pride ourselves on really intimately getting to know our clients because then we're able to specialize in them. We're a generalist agency, which means we can plan anywhere over the entire world. And so we have contacts on the ground in each location. And those are our specialists in each location. But we are a specialist in our traveler. So in my world, in the process work that I do, customer journey is critical. I believe that the customer is the center of the business universe. And in becoming the specialist in your customer, not the destinations, you're really able to and you know provide the customer service experience that you want. And I love that you talk about it as being 90% therapy, right? Because that's the human experience. Obviously, you hinted at you know the pandemic was it was detrimental to the growth of your business um, and, and provided its own challenges and obstacles but you overcame that. So talk us through the journey of hitting the obstacle, hitting the challenge, overcoming it and growing from being a husband and wife duo to a thriving business where you have multiple advisors. The, the number I had was 70. I don't know if that's ab absolutely correct, but that's a huge, that's exponential growth. So take us through that part of your journey. Yeah. Yeah. So it's so important to think about this too, that as that pandemic hit, I was also experiencing a bit of a crisis myself when it came to burning out as a frontline travel advisor. And that's because I had taken on the role of chief salesperson, chief mentor, chief CEO, right? Chief, 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 all these different roles where there were too many things on my plate. And so I really had to come to an agreement and understanding of, I cannot be everything to everyone as I have always been as an entrepreneur. And I think that's really hard as a solopreneur, right? Like if you are the lead practitioner in your business and you have the opportunity to grow and scale, sometimes it's really hard to let your hands off of the bottleneck that you are creating. So the pandemic actually hit at a perfect time in my life because it allowed me to do that in a way that then saw flourishing on the other side. So that kind of growth occurred so much because I was able to say, all right, 
my time as a frontline travel advisor has come to an end because we have a phenomenal team of advisors, right? Like they all do this way better than I ever have been able to. They're completely blowing my mind when they come to the table with their ideas and, and they should be the ones that are leading that part of the business in order for me to step aside and lead the actual business and help grow it. And so, you know, a lot of that was a bit of a CEO journey and stepping out of what was instant gratification from sales and what never feels like instant gratification from leadership. And when you talk about making it through that time, I think that was the refining of leadership for both my my husband and myself. This was a time that, side note, when he entered into the business, I, I had founded the business. When he entered in, we were not business partners. He always had the dream of being a partner in, in, in a, you know, an entrepreneurial venture. I am an only child. I am super independent. I never had the dream of a partner. So it just became abundantly evident though, that we had really unique skills that the two of us could help uplevel this business if we were to trust each other, which is not a natural given from a work environment, from your home environment. So we had to do this dance. We had to learn how to trust each other. And we both became such better leaders through that time because we were able to see all right, what is this going to do for the good of the business? What is this going to do for the whole of our family life and the the future we're creating for our daughter, now daughters? And so that journey was just so important because we were able to put on the leadership hat and really learn to maintain our lanes. And, and I think truly it was, it was two things. It was that that we're talking about, but it was also the leveraging of obstacles as opportunities. So in 2021, Instead of purchasing a home, which I mentioned, we we actually walked away from our home. So we had to make that painful decision in 2020. 2021, by that point, the government had rolled out assistance. We were able to keep a longer run rate than we were anticipating. This is great because it's still going on. When's it going to come back? We then got an opportunity to acquire another business that was actually pre-pandemic larger than us, had been in business longer than us, was super well-respected. I had such a girl crush on the founder, right? Like I loved everything she had been doing. And um, so we had this opportunity that we were able to leverage. And I think that those two things, it was the maintaining our lanes, like really stepping into the roles of leadership that we were required to step into and the seizing of opportunities that allowed us to really flourish on the other side. And and that's absolutely fabulous information, right? Audience, if you were listening, right? Lindsay just took us through the solopreneur journey and and stepping into being CEO. And that is such a challenging step in every progression of business because you have to step away from the front line. Lindsay's words, instant gratification, right? And that sales cycle to actually digging into what it takes to make the business grow today, but also have the space to look to the future which you know led to the ability to make that acquisition of a business. And if you had been still focused on sell, 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 when selling wasn't actually what was happening, right, that's an opportunity that could have been missed. And I love mm -hmm. the mindset that you shared, obstacles are opportunities, right? If we just want to beat our head against a brick wall as a CEO, or even still in the solopreneur space, that is the end of that part of the journey right? That is an, a block, but if you can look around the corner of it to see what you can do with it, um, that is where you take the obstacle and create opportunity. Lindsay, one of the things in the travel industry, and we, I want to change our direction just a little bit, becoming a CEO and owning a business and founding a business in a male-dominated industry, right? Your experience, you started down the path in the industry young, and grew up, I'm going to say, you use the phrase, grew up in it, and then, you know, have decided now to lead it. And that's fabulous. What is that journey like? And what are some of the, um, what are some of the cool successes you've had in, in that space? Because you come at the business from a different perspective. You know, it's funny when, when we talked a little bit before recording, and you mentioned this about a male dominated industry from the outside, looking in the travel industry feels very predominantly female. But when it comes to leadership, that's when it becomes much more predominantly male. And when it comes to outside looking in individuals who see a travel agent, I will never forget the comments that were made toward me and my cute little hobby, right? So I do think there is a lot of value in being underestimated. Um, I, I actually had a, an instance with uh, a, my parents lived next door to a neurosurgeon. And when he found out what I did, he made a really snide remark of, well, how much schooling did you have to go to to get that job? And I remember like, you know, it, it was so snide and it was like, well, obviously not the funny thing. This is not funny, but 
he actually wound up going under due to malpractice a few years later. And so it was just a condescending remark, right? But it was the outside looking in of, well, that's cute. You're a little salesperson, you know? And so when my husband, who was my fiance at the time, started really understanding the, the inner workings of my business. And, and listen, he's a financial analyst with Merrill Lynch at the time. So he knows his stuff. Like this is not just someone, and he's got his MBA and he like he started going, oh my God, this is, this is doing really well. And also, wow, look at the potential that it has. And I'm like, yeah, I know. I feel like I'm constantly riding a dragon. So from that perspective, it was always interesting to me to see the way people would perceive me. And I think too, I, I mean, I was in my twenties and now I'm in my early thirties and, and I have a very outgoing personality. And I think it's really easy to underestimate all of those qualities, right? Youth and being a little bit more vibrant. And, and also I'm never afraid to say, I don't know something, uh, which I think sometimes in certain settings, people are like, gosh, what a, can't believe she would admit that, but I'm, I, I there's only one way to be and that's authentic. And I need people to know I failed macroeconomics, but I still run a business, you know, like it, you don't have to <laughs> have done it all perfectly. And, and so back to the original question of, of being a female in a male dominated industry, I think all of those, those characteristics have really played well for me. Um, and sometimes I play them up, you know, sometimes like I know when someone is underestimating me and, and I like to lean into that a little bit and, and let people be surprised by what I and the company are capable of. I am a snide and snarky person. And I absolutely adore the fact that you write that you describe this as you know, the value of being underestimated and it happens in industries all it happens often. And it's not just a female issue. We can, you know, anybody can be underestimated at any moment in time, but to lean into it and, and, and to play with that. I, I personally, I absolutely love that because it's totally something that I have done and encourage people to do because if the people around you are not taking you seriously. That's on them. Mm -hmm. The results in what you're building and what you're growing and the team that you've developed and the financial results that you're getting tell the story and to let somebody draw a false conclusion. And I, to call your work a hobby is so just insulting. Oh my gosh. Um, you know, yeah. Hobbies don't, don't employ 70 people. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Just let's keep it real simple. Uh, hobbies don't, uh, don't employ 70 people. So I love the fact that you're willing to not feel that as a burden, but to, to say, okay, fine. You want to, you want to play, I'll show you what mm -hmm. I'm actually capable of. And that just, you know, that just elevates you as a leader, as a business owner, who's growing something. We all, there are naysayers out there. There are rude, inconsiderate, thoughtless people and not taking them seriously, I think is a really important secret to your success because yeah. that could really have stalled your development as, as an owner. Yes. Yeah. You're so right. You're so spot on. I also love that you admitted that you're snarky because sometimes I'm petty. And so if anyone is ever in the same position, here was something fun that we got to do, right? And this was not from pettiness, this, but this was pretty fun to do is when people don't take you seriously, they certainly don't see that you're about to acquire another company that's double your size. And to be able to then strike a media deal that goes live with you on the cover of the largest industries publication saying, we acquired this company. I mean, the jaws that dropped because of that announcement were so cool for me to see because it was, it was a lot of the men that dominated the industry that would have liked the opportunity to acquire that other company. And that we're shocked that it was it was me that did it. So sometimes it's fun to have that element of surprise. And so if you listener are ever going through this, just know there are ways that you can you can eventually come out of playing the uh, let them underestimate you and let them know who they're actually dealing with. And those are huge moments. And to have the industry acknowledgement of what you had just accomplished, congratulations that you were able to play the media and really stand into. Not only have I built something worthwhile, it's good enough that I'm able to acquire and here we are and we're not going anywhere Yeah, um, to stand in that and own it because oftentimes women have been coached early in their careers in a way that you never had to go through this because you started down a path early enough, but you know, to be seen and not heard. Mm. to be, to be humble and not take credit for things. Right. And, and there's all sorts of things that have happened that you're, you're, you're challenging those norms and doing it 
with grace and elegance and because you're building something that's valuable and that's working. And so as those gentlemen are looking at that article, congratulations, that's freaking awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you talk about disrupting and innovating. And, yes. and I think what was so neat about that entire storyline is that we purchased another female founded boutique company. And the message that that was able to send is that entrepreneurs are here to stay, that this is not, because prior to that, every acquisition that happened was a mega, mega agency gobbling up the smaller ones, right? It was just a ton of consolidation. And so I think it's it's really important, no matter what industry we're in, to kind of think of the larger message that our movements can send. And that was how we, we posed that when we did send it to the media. It was, hey, there's a lot of hope out there because if you are sitting in the seat that I was in 15 years ago, you too can go down this road and do this exact same thing. And so to be able to, to send a message of positivity to other entrepreneurs was a really important part of that acquisition. And for female founders, it's also a real story of empowerment because we know that investment money is hard to come by for a female founder. And so as, as you grew and you were able to acquire another female owned business, right? Entrepreneurship is what drives the American economy mm -hmm. and female founders are grossly underfunded, but leading highly successful businesses without that help. And so yeah. this is just another story and another example of what we can do together when we as women work together to build and grow our businesses, um, especially when venture capital and some of those other investment opportunities are so much harder to come by. When we do it from the bottom up and push, um, you can do great things. Yeah. Lindsay, Lindsay, as you're looking to the future and what you're building and what you're growing, what are some of the things on the horizon that you're growing towards? So it's a good question because it, there was actually a point through this acquisition, through that cover story, where I achieved my 10-year goals in two years. And it was all thanks to, you know, the catalyst of a world pandemic. And so, so there's a bit of an identity crisis. And also I became a mother at the same time, right? Where I was going, oh, well, I accomplished all the goals that I wanted to hit by 40, but I'm only 32 or whatever it was. And so what are my new goals? And then also this, this business is now, you know, it's, it's left its infancy stages and it's, it's a teenager. It's got a beautiful team at the helm. I have empowered my husband, who's now my business partner as our COO, who runs the day-to-day -day operations so that my mind and, and capacity is freed up to really help scale the company. Um, so for 2024, let's just focus right now on, on where we're at. Our goal for the year is to amplify. And some of that is because the travel advisor story is still so untold. You know, most people still think, like we started this conversation, that it's gone the way of the dinosaur. And so what if I could get out and be a mouthpiece on behalf of Jet Set World Travel? And part of the way that I've done that is I actually launched a podcast called Who Made You the Boss? And the idea is for entrepreneurs, right? We have this bit of a joke of, well, I made myself the boss and now I have to own up to that and all of the little gremlins that get in our head because of it. So perfectionism and imposter syndrome and, you know, control and all the things that we, we think that we know and that start feeling very isolating on this journey. So I did that because our team has a mixture of both in-house employees as well as contractors who are their own bosses. And so there's this through line of professional development that I think is really important that we do internally at Jet Set. And now we're doing it externally as well to take some of those lessons that we've learned. Um, so when I think about what's in the future, I super enjoy that. I love the idea of thought leadership. I love the idea of speaking and pouring into others. Mentorship's always been a really important aspect of my life. And and now to be able to do that on behalf of Jet Set as kind of an outward ambassador is really, really important work. Absolutely fabulous. And I love in that, right, that you, you the growth of the company is awesome. And pouring back into your employees and understanding the needs of your actual full-time employees that are different from your contract staff and well, you know, a podcast is a really wonderful thing. And I'm, I'm a big supporter of people who want to start and run podcasts to share information because in our world today, I genuinely believe that we've stopped listening to dialogue and conversation. And yet we have this vibrant world of podcasting where we can listen to things that we may not have ever thought of perspectives that may contradict what we know or feel and can actually legitimately learn. And so another congratulations to taking on the amplification amplification of a message that was not easy for me to say and and sharing with with other business owners and leaders who are trying to grow and and do 
what is best for them and giving them a platform to learn. Yeah. Thanks. It, you know, I, I became hyper obsessed, especially when you asked it, it, telling the story back on, on jet set and the evolution, right? Like mm-hmm. I became hyper obsessed with the idea of using mm-hmm. our negative moments, like using our burnout or using our imposter syndrome and actually leveraging those to our betterment. And, and so much of the stories we talk about on the podcast are, are those, right? It was every milestone that I mentioned about the, you know, creation and development of jet set, was due to a time where I was personally burned out. You know, as a frontline travel advisor, I loved the work that I did for years and years. And then I just started feeling like a, a human punching bag. And and it's because my intuition and my gut were saying, hey, it's time to evolve. This is not even burnout. This is actually evolution that you need to step into. And I just feel like we don't talk about that enough. And, and it's interesting that you you mentioned specifically the the journey of a female founder, because I think very often, or at least this is my experience, um, I had wonderful male mentors in business. And I was often told when I would get emotional about something happening, right? Like a client said this, it made me so sad to just get thicker skin. And I think a lot of times, right? A lot of times females are taught to show up, to boss up, to get thicker skin, to not be like, to be the male version of who we think we should be. And um, in attempting to do that and attempting to callous, I found that my skin was getting thinner and thinner for those activities. And then I realized, wait a minute, like this is my feminine intuition. This is something that's uniquely wired for me and me alone to tap into, to realize it's not that I have thin skin. It's that I'm not supposed to be doing this thing part of the job, right? So who do I need to employ to get it done? And that way I can step into the things that I'm good at. And I, and I, we'll, we'll follow this for a second because it's absolutely true, right? We do not have to be more, we don't have to be thick skinned. We Emotion is important. Emotion is how we connect, how we make and enhance our customers' journeys and their experiences. And when we're there there for them in those moments, the connection that's formed and the stickiness of that relationship is so much more authentic and real. And it's not booking a, a travel experience one time. It's taking care of that family for their lifetime. And it's an entirely different thing. And so, yes, absolutely. Um, stepping away from the way that dudes do it and doing and finding your own authentic self. My own authentic self is not overly feminine, but it is, you know, it is me. And, and, and sometimes it's emotional and Mm -hmm. emotion means different things for different people, but we all actually experience them. So they're very human. Um, So not experiencing and expressing them is really the broken mindset. Yeah. But that's the age old mindset, right? It's just business. And there's no room for emotions. And I, I think that that is so incorrect. It, it absolutely is. Um, and one female mentor I had early in my career shared with me that in times of stress, and she was a senior vice president of a financial institution, in times of stress, when she's angry, she cries and there's nothing that she can do about it. The tears mm-hmm. just flow. And, you know, she had been coached and mentored. You need to step out. You need to do these things. And she goes, no, those are just tears. You can still listen to my words and we can, you know, we can solve this problem. But if you're going to focus on that one thing, that's your problem, not my problem. If you need to step out of the room, feel free. Yeah. And I was like, you go. Yes. So there's, there are so many different ways of doing things. And Lindsay, thank you for sharing your perspective and and the nuances of this, because you've shared challenges and opportunities, how we turn obstacles into opportunity and how in the worst of times, finding that opportunity to acquire another business, have exponential growth and really seeded yourself as a leader in your industry. Hmm. Um, for my audience, you know, the rules don't get left behind. Join me next time. That's it for today's episode of Disrupt and Innovate. Head over to iTunes and subscribe to the show. Every single week, one lucky listener that posts a review on iTunes will win the grand prize drawing, a $15,000 private VIP day with Lisa Levy. And be sure to head over to disruptandinnovate.com and get your free copy of Lisa's gift and join us on our next episode. Disrupt and Innovate.